Welcome all. Um, welcome to Avia Pasternak's professorial inaugural lecture. I'm Ben Lauderdale. I'm the head of Department of Political Science, and I'm pleased to see such a terrific turnout. This is um, the first of our series of inaugural lectures this year, of which we have nine, which is a departmental record um, by some margin, I think. Um, one of the last of these that we ran just before COVID sent us all away um, back in January 2020 was my own, which I greatly enjoyed, and I look forward to seeing someone else um, present one today. Since January 2020, um, when we last held these, um, the department has promoted five staff to professor and hired in two outside professors. Um, and we already had a small backlog when COVID hit. So we're excited to be able to reconvene and hear about the outstanding work of colleagues old and new. Um, Avia joined UCL as a lecturer in 2014 and was promoted to professor effective last month. Um, Albert Wheel, who is um, behind me on the screen, um, who has recently retired from UCL after a long and distinguished career in political theory, will be shortly providing a proper introduction to Avia's work. Um, this is fortunate because my knowledge of Avia is overwhelmingly shaped by last academic year, during which I was in my first year as head of department and Avia was in her second year as director of education for our department. So we spent a lot of the last year navigating the challenges of, of administering our department's teaching through um, the latter stages of the pandemic. Um, this makes me equipped to speak to Avia's tremendous contributions to UCL and to the educational mission of the department, but less so on the research contributions that Albert will, I'm sure, speak to in a moment. Um, what I do want to say is that Avia can navigate university administration with skill and humor, and that's no small thing. Um, more generally, there's much to be said for having a political theorist who works on questions of non-ideal theory in academic administration. Um, the distinction, that distinction between ideal and non-ideal theory and the different ways that one ought to reason about each is critical to navigating the challenges of delivering education at scale, and certainly never more so than during the pandemic. Um, I'm going to resist the urge to draw any direct analogies to Avia's work on when violent protest against the state might be justified. <laughs> um, what I will do instead is remind you that there will be a drinks reception after the lecture in the South Cloisters. And with that, I will hand over to Albert for a proper introduction. Uh, thank you very much, Ben, for that introduction. And let me begin by apologizing for not being able to be with you in person uh, today, but I have uh, shielding responsibilities. But it is a great privilege uh, to be invited, uh, even if only at a distance, um, to talk about Avia's work and to say a little bit about Avia as a person and a colleague as well. I suppose that most of us at some time or another will have had the experience of being upgrade, upbraided or criticised over the policies of the state uh, of which to which we belong, whether that be the history of colonialism, the discharge of pollution into the global commons, or the conduct of a war. A natural tendency for us as uh, individuals, I think, in these circumstances is to deny our part in the wrong. I did not vote for them. Uh, I was not born then. Uh, I was out of the country uh, at the time. But is this response at all plausible or adequate? Over the last decade or more, uh, one of Avia's Pasternak's central concerns in her research has been to explore the answers to this question. What really are the grounds and what is the extent to which, as individuals, we must take responsibility for the wrongs committed by the state of which we're a part? And this approach begins with what she calls the distributive effect, the seemingly puzzling fact that the corporate wrongdoing of, of the state as a collective actor falls upon its citizens as individuals from the collective all according to its wrongdoing to the individual each, according to his or her membership. For Avia, this chain of responsibility is not broken by voluntary abstention by individuals in relationship to any particular policy, uh, nor is it feasible to assign responsibility only to those who are most actively supportive of or participated in the wrongful policy, be they rich firms who helped finance the wrongdoing or the partisans who advocated it. Instead, what grounds the responsibility of individual citizens for the wrongs committed by their state is their civic participation in the maintenance of that uh, state and its corporate life. From this starting point, Avia shows further how we must take into account the fact that different types of state 
will stand in different sorts of relationships with their citizens so that the ascription of responsibility is always context sensitive. Avi has developed these arguments in her widely acclaimed book, uh, Responsible Citizens, Irresponsible States, Should Citizens Pay for Their State's wrong Wrongdoings, published by Oxford University Press in August 2021. She will be expanding on the arguments of this book and its implications in her lecture tonight. Let me say something about uh, Avia uh, as a colleague and as a person. Um, she graduated uh, with a BA summa cum laude from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. She went on to do an MA at the Hebrew University uh, before moving to Oxford to do a DPhil with David Miller. She was then a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford and uh, later at UCL. Uh, where in fact uh, she and I shared an office uh, for a short while, uh, before she landed a job in the Department of Government at the University of Essex. She then came back to UCL in 2014, which has always seemed to me to be the right place, given her political philosophy. That political philosophy is a radical one, in the sense that it goes to the roots of the issues with which it deals and forces us to question our common sense assumptions. As we all know, UCL was founded under the influence of Bentham's utilitarian political philosophy, a philosophy that contained uh, among its principal tenets, the view that the state existed to serve the interests of its citizens and that that state responsibility was uh, best discharged by being grounded in structures of government that were democratically accountable. John Stuart Mill referred to the utilitarians as philosophic radicals, by which he meant that their political radi radicalism was based on intellectual conviction. Now, Avia is not a utilitarian, but she is, I think, a philosophical radical in Mill's sense. For her, our practices cannot be right unless they can be defended by well-articulated arguments. Good intentions unaccompanied by clear thought are never enough. I conjecture that it's also an implication of her theory that among other things, states will best serve the interests of their citizens by upholding their self-assumed treaty obligations in an international order so that liability for wrongdoing will not be distributed to citizens uh, in the future. Perhaps an important lesson for post-Brexit UK. In her work, Abby has explored the way in which the activities of the collective affect the responsibilities of individuals. But we can turn that logic around and ask how individual activities can promote the good of the collective. Responsible individual action makes for more responsible corporate action. During her career at UCL, Avia has contributed greatly to the corporate life of the college through her teaching and administration, as Ben referred to uh, a few minutes ago, as well as her research. Not only has she been an outstanding teacher herself, but she had the responsibility for being director of education during the most difficult period of COVID. More than all these individual activities, however, has been her sheer presence in the Department of Political Science, giving all her colleagues the sense that if Avia is involved in any matter, things will go well. Unusually, and rather sadly, I think this, all, this inaugural is also a, a valedictory. In either guise, however, I'm sure it will demonstrate the benefit we have all received from Avia's contribution to our collective academic life, as well as her contribution to the Invisible College of Political Theorists internationally. As always, I look forward to what Professor Pasternak has to say. Thank you very much, Albert. Hope you can hear me. Thank you very much uh, for this very kind introduction. And thank you, Ben, for your kind introduction. And thanks to Alan and Eleanor for putting this event together, for jumping me in the long queue of inaugurals that the department is, uh, is anticipating. And I'd like, of course, to thank everybody who's here. It's wonderful to see both colleagues and students and uh, colleagues and students and faces that I don't recognize. It's wonderful. And a special thanks to my mother, Nurit, and my uh, niece, Michal, who came all the way from Israel to represent the family. The rest of them, I believe, are on Zoom, but that's for the gods of the, of the 
internet, you know. Um, okay, so in my talk today, I want to share with you uh, some of the core findings that um, I had uh, throughout my research career. And throughout this career, I was interested mostly so far in understanding what duties fall on us as citizens when our governments um, act wrongfully in our name. So imagine, for example, that your state embarks on a military operation that you deeply disagree with and, and know is unjust. Or imagine that in the not too distant past, your state colonized and exploited some distant lands and that much of the country's wealth that you enjoy today was appropriated as the fruit of that wrongdoing. Or finally, imagine that the basic institutions of your society discriminate, let's say, against racial minorities, denying them de facto equal opportunities to the social basis of self-respect. You yourself object to any form of discrimination, and yet you find yourself participating in the institutions and the practices that enable that discrimination. So what follows from all of this for you as an individual? Should you feel ashamed from the benefits you enjoy, even though you didn't take part in the wrongdoing of the past? Do you have any special obligations to the injured parties, the parties that were injured by your state's wrongdoing, even if you yourself didn't support the, the policies that led to that harm? So these are the type of questions that I personally found fascinating, challenging to this very day. And what I want to do in my talk today is present to you some of my answers to them. But I want to take, first of all, a little step back and tell you a little bit about why I work on these questions. Um, and when I arrived to Oxford, and that was in 2003, to Oxford University, to pursue my DPhil in politics, I would say that the dominant approach to political theory back then, at least in, U in the UK, was principally engaged with questions of what we call ideal theory. And by that I mean questions about the political arrangement that should pertain in a just and in an ideal society. So for example, if you looked at the Oxford's PPE degree uh, prelims reading list, it was mostly dominated by analysis of John Rawls' theory of justice. And if you look at the pages of major political theory journals, you'd find lack egalitarians and democratic egalitarians exchanging scholastic blows about the question of distributive justice. But I was less attracted to these type of questions. My interest in political philosophy focused from the very start on the dominance of injustice rather than on the possibility of justice. In other words, I am interested in what we call non-ideal political philosophy. It's a term we use to describe the study of the ethical challenges that spring from our political reality, marred as it is by historical and by ongoing wrongdoings like the ones I've just described. Now, off the top of my head, I can think of at least three reasons why I am drawn to these questions. And I'm mentioning these reasons not to bore you, but because there's a good opportunity for me to thank some of the people and the institutions that have been so pivotal to my own development, both as a researcher and as a person. So the first two people that I want to mention here are, of course, my parents. I grew up in Jerusalem with what I would call a Marxist father and a mother who I can now diagnose with fairly anarchistic, anarchistic tendencies. And despite these tendencies, my parents were both deeply rooted and committed to their Israeli identity. At the same time, they were very critical of many of the Israeli state policies. And to this very day, when I think and when I write political philosophy, I write to them. The second source of my influence is my DPhil supervisor, David Miller, who is also with, with, uh, here with us tonight. And David has always believed in the importance of what he calls political philosophy for earthlings. And he encouraged me to use common sense views and the experience of real people as a starting point for doing political philosophy. David's work, his supervision, 
And his continuous advice over the years remains a constant source of inspiration for me. Third, and not least, is my department here at UCL. I was fortunate to join the department in 2014 and being surrounded by top-notch and extremely collegial political scientists, I was highly motivated to engage with questions that they too find relevant and interesting. And that pushed me in the direction of non-ideal theory. Not only that, but we have a very strong political theory group here. Um, when I joined the department, Cecile, Albert, Richard, Jeff, Emily and Saladin all engage in various ways in questions of ethics and public policy. This team is of course just growing stronger, producing ever more exciting research with the addition of new colleagues over the years, John and John, Helen, Ying and Fergus, and it's wonderful to see this group. Okay, so now that we know what inspired me, I now want to take you the journey on the substantive parts of uh, my research. And if you've been paying attention so far, you'll have realized that I've been thinking about the question of citizens' responsibility for almost 20 years. Actually, when I thought about it, it was really 19 years, because I'm not entirely sure what I was doing in my first year of my PhD in Oxford, <laughs> but so let's call it 19 years. Um, and to make sure we do make it to the reception in time, I'm just going to talk about my most recent work, which I hope is also the best given the benefits of time and experience. So my presentation will, proce will proceed in three parts. I'm going to give you uh, the theoretical argument I've developed for why I think citizens are responsible for states' wrongdoing, in the cases like those I mentioned. And then we're going to discuss what we can learn from uh, this argument about the permissibility of sanctions on rogue states. And finally, I will consider the implications for civil resistance campaigns against state injustices, which is a topic of my, the book I'm currently writing. So let's start with the question of citizens' responsibility. Um, as Albert already mentioned, if we look at the world, we see that as ordinary tax-paying citizens, we typically are held responsible for what our governments are doing in our name. By responsible, I want to emphasize, I mean something very specific. I mean that we are the one who end up fixing the wrongs that our governments have caused. Now, of course, in the real world, many states' wrongdoings and bad policies remain unfixed. Nevertheless, at least sometimes, governments do engage, whether voluntarily or because somebody forces them to do that, in the project of fixing the wrongs that they have committed. West Germany, for example, paid reparations to the State of Israel in an attempt to compensate for some of the atrocities inflicted by the Third Reich. Iraq paid compensation to Kuwait and to other injured parties in the aftermath of the Gulf War. The Canadian government, government paid reparations to people it had forcibly removed as children from their indigenous communities, and the list goes on. Now, I think everybody would agree that in all these cases, it's a good thing that the injured parties re obtain some redress, partial at least. But notice that in all these cases, the government used the public purse to discharge its remedial obligations. So what that meant in practice is that it's the citizens of the state, of the state who actually end up settling the check. The state's responsibility to fix its own wrongdoing was de facto distributed to the population. Now that fact seemed troublesome. Why should the citizens foot the bill uh, for what the government are doing or had done if they themselves are not the ones who committed the wrongs in question? So think of those who were very young or those who were not even born yet when the wrongdoing was committed or think about those who did not know about it or those who protested against it. In all these cases, it seems that these people have good reasons um, to reject the claim that they ought to be kind of footing the bill. And I think their objection is important because if we want compensation schemes to kind of uh, get going, we need to persuade the population of the state that they ought to participate in fixing the problem. And my own answer for why citizens share responsibility is partly inspired by the sentiments 
of many political activists that I myself encountered as a young person in Israel. I was at the time involved in political activity against the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories. And this was a period when the Oslo peace accord had all but collapsed. And the political resistance to the ongoing occupation felt futile. In fact, looking back, it was futile. Nevertheless, there was this kind of dogged determination amongst the activists in that group to continue the struggle. And despite the deep disagreement with the state, I always felt like they had this profound sense of belonging to the state. And in, li in light of that se sense, some kind of a personal responsibility, a sense of personal responsibility to the very policies, policies that they themselves were protesting against. And this attitude stayed with me, and it is that attitude that is the core of my answer to our question. And I believe that this attitude goes back to the very idea of citizenship. What does it mean to be a citizen? I think that if we think about this question, we notice that typically for most of us, being a citizen is not merely a kind of a passive status. Citizenship involves all sorts of doing things. For example, we vote. Some of us serve in the military. We pay taxes and so on and so forth. And what I want to suggest to you is that when we perform these acts, we are actually taking part in some form of collective action. We are acting together with other citizens. And our actions, this active acting together, is what maintains our state as an institution that is able to execute various policies. And what do I mean by acting together in the state? To act together with others, you need to intend to contribute to something that is larger than or bigger than yourself, to a group, to a collective act. So if you can imagine just a two persons example, so two people taking a walk together are different from two people who just happen to walk side by side in the street because these two people intend to walk together, intend to have a walk. And having that intention, or having that, uh, contrib that uh, intentional contribution um, puts these people in a special relation to each other. They become part of a group. And Moral philosophers have also argued that people who act together have a special normative relation to the outcome of their collective act. They are part of the we who did it. And this relationship is, more, is important. It means something. It becomes part of us. Wow. Okay. I've got an agreement here. Um, now, as any academic who has ever sat on a faculty meeting would know, we often find ourselves in situations where we don't endorse the policies or the decisions that are made by the group that we are part of. Still, as long as we play a role in contributing to the realization of the decision, we are part of the group that made that decision. And that means that if the group needs to fix a mistake, if we made a bad decision, then we are part of the, still part of the group who shares that responsibility. Now, these general reflections on what it means to act together are familiar from philosophical literature on collective actions, but I believe they can be used to explain also the relationship that exists between citizens when they perform their various roles in the state. When we act as citizens in the way that I've described, we are intending to contribute to the institutions of our state. We do that in order so our state can actually decide on certain policies and enact them. Some of these policies we agree with, others we don't. But like those committee members I mentioned, we intend to take part in the state and therefore remain part of the group that made the decision. And what flows from these observations about the nature of citizenship confirms, I think, the sentiments of those political activists I mentioned earlier. Because we participate in our state in this way, we incur a special responsibility with regard to the outcomes of our state's actions. <laughs> 
all of us, simply by virtue of our participation in our state, can be expected to contribute to remedying our state's wrongdoings. The fact that we intentionally take part in our state explains why we should share the burdens of fixing its wrongdoing, even if we disagree with the policies. Now you might notice that this argument is grounded in and also tied to the way that people see their citizenship and their own contributions to the state. So people need to intend to, be, to do their part in order to count as responsible. Now, if you're empiric an empirically minded person, as some of the people in this room are, um, you might wonder how applicable are these ideas to um, the reality? How common is it for citizens to have these attitudes I just described? Now, in my book, I argue that they are actually quite common. But I'm not going down to kind of expound on the research, on the, on the findings, that empirical findings that support this claim. Instead, what I want to do is just leave this question with you to answer for yourself. How do you see your citizenship status? Do you see it as a passive status? Or do you recognize that you are doing some things that contribute to the maintenance of your state? Furthermore, do you resent these contributions? Do you feel that you are forced to or manipulated by your state to be kind of be part of it? Or do you actually feel that playing this role is something you appreciate, that you wouldn't want to give it up, even if you could? In my view, these answers that each of us have for these questions determine our normative relationship to our state and our responsibility for its actions. Okay, so I presented to you so far what I believe is a source of citizens' duty to fix a state's wrongdoing. And I focused on schemes of reparation and compensation. But um, addressing states' wrongdoing is not always um, about assisting those who are injured by your state. There are other burdens, I believe, that we might be expected to bear as participants in our state. And one of these burdens could be uh, absorbing the costs of sanctions. So what I have in mind here specifically are the type of cultural and economic sanctions that are directed sometimes against rogue states um, with the aim of pressuring the rogue states to uh, stop itself from committing some serious wrongdoing. One example, one famous historical example, is a comprehensive international cultural and economic sanctions that were imposed on South Africa uh, during the apartheid era, when, which brought to the end of the apartheid rule. A more recent example is, called, is of course the international sanctions that are imposed on Russia in response to its invasion to Ukraine. As you all know, to date there have been extensive sanctions on Russian banks and on Russian exports in energy, in technology, in transportation. And these sanctions led, at least initially, to the fall of the value of the Russian rubble, ruble sorry, and to um, various uh, types of economic hardships for ordinary Russians and businesses. Now, looking at the debate that surrounds these type of sanctions, we can identify at least two um, core objections to sanctions. The first is about the efficacy of international sanctions. Some political scientists point out that sanctions are not very effective at changing a wrong rogue regime's policies. If anything, the, so the argument goes, they generate kind of a rally around the flag effect amongst the population and kind of actually bolster the regime's resistance to change. Now, as a political theorist, it's not my place here to kind of assess the strength of the empirical statement. Um, but it is worth pointing out that not everybody in that literature thinks that sanctions are always ineffective. For example, the sanctions against South Africa arguably did have a desired, the desired effect. And as for Russia, of course the jury is still out, um, but perhaps there is a case to be made that economic pressure will actually undermine Russia's ability to continue the war. And we might also wonder in this context what other tools are available to us short of a military intervention against Russia. 
I think many of us would agree that despite the shortcomings, sanctions kind of remain, can remain our best shot at preventing wars. But there's another objection to comprehensive sanctions that is less practical and more normative or moral. And here people are worried that the imp about the impact of sanctions on ordinary people. Um, sanctions, it is often uh, said, are like collective punishment. They are indiscriminate, they are unfair because they harm the whole populations of the target country. And I think that the ideas I presented earlier about participation in the state suggest that this concern uh, can sometimes actually be met. The idea here is that if we participate intentionally in our state, then we have the duty to share the burdens of remedying its wrongdoings. And if our government refuses to actually turn around and stop causing harm, then, um, and if what is required in order for it to change its mind is some economic pressure, then it follows that we, the citizens who participate in the state, do have the duties to incur the burdens of that hardship. Not because we support the bad policies and are blameworthy for that, but because we participate in a state that created these policies. That said, it's also the case that my framework also points to important limitations on the scope of responsibility for state policies. Because for the arguments of my argument for responsibility to make sense, as we saw, citizens have to intend to take part in their state. This means that sh they should not be forced against their will to be part of it. They should not be viewing their state as kind of an alien force in their life that manipulates them and uses them as tools. Um, I think that um, for most citizens who live in democratic states, this sense of alienation its not how they experience their relationship in this state. But what about um, citizens of authoritarian states like Russia today? Here the picture is obviously much more complicated and more complex. Um, many citizens are not able to oppose their governments in such states for fear of persecution. Um, and also there's a problem of state manipulation. Right? So in democratic states we have access to sources of fairly reliable information about our government's policies, but in non-democracies that's not always the case. So at times government control and manipulate the information that their citizens are consuming and that poses a problem for my argument because if you don't understand the nature of the state you're participating in, how can you genuinely uh, uh, take part in it? So in order to know whether economic sanctions can overcome that unfairness objection, we need to engage in qualitative research about the relationship between citizens and their governments and how they came to have their attitudes to their state. In the book that I just mentioned, I do that, kind of engage with qualitative research on uh, the case of Iraq around under the regime, uh, under the Ba'ath regime, in order to examine the justifiability of the economic sanctions on Iraq and suggest that given the very high modes of repression that, that the regime deployed, these sanctions cannot meet the fairness objection. And I look at alternative solutions. The answer would be different, I think, in the case of, the South, Africa, of South Africa under apartheid, at least with regards to the white population. What the answer is with regard to Russia today requires further examination of the nature of citizens' support of their government there. And all this is suggests is that there's actually a deep connection between political science and political theory. We need both theoretical and normative reflection in order to know uh, what to do with the facts that we have at hand. Right, so I now want to turn to another implication of my conceptual argument. And here I want to present to you um, some um, findings of my more recent uh, research project, which, well, I call it recent, but I actually started working on it, looking at the calendar in 2015, which is not that recent. And that is project is on violent protests in democratic societies. And my initial interest in this uh, project was, uh, and this topic was sparked by my colleague, who's also here, Emily McTernan. Emily and I shared an office, uh, which is very, very well hidden in the SPP maze. 
In fact, I suspect there might be still some emaciated lost students wandering the halls looking for our um, kind of wandering the corridors of 31 Tavistock Square looking for us. But uh, while we were there, Emily had, and I had some great conversations about life in general and about political philosophy in particular. And uh, one of the topics that we stumbled upon was the question of the violent protests that occurred in London in 2011. And um, those protests affected the areas where both Emily and I lived. And you might recall that these protests uh, were sparked when the police shot and killed a young black man in Tottenham. Um, it was during a police arrest. And that incident was followed by protests that very quickly turned violence, uh, protesters confronting police, looting shops, setting fire to police cars and to buildings. Now, when Emily and I first discussed this, I was convinced that such behavior was clearly wrong and impermissible. And Emily didn't agree. So we had a good argument, and I could not persuade Emily. Uh, so I started reading about the history of violent protests in the UK and elsewhere, about the impact on public policy. I wanted to equip myself with better arguments for our next conversation. Um, and during that research, I discovered a few things which uh, surprised me. First, I discovered that violent and uncivil protests are actually fairly common in modern political life. And secondly, that political theorists have paid scant attention to them. Mostly, when political theorists refer to them, they kind of had the same knee-jerk reaction that I originally had, that such disorderly and dangerous conduct can never be justified. But the more I read and the more I thought about it, the more persuaded I became that this kind of knee-jerk reaction is, uh, cannot be easily justified. And if we take real-world conditions into account and think carefully about the circumstances and the goals of protesters. And these thoughts that I had on violent protest eventually appeared as a paper in uh, the Journal of Philosophy and Public Affairs. And I received many comments and feedback on this publication. And this conversation kept going on, so I decided eventually to develop my response to a book manuscript, which I now completed, completing, almost completed, and the title is No Justice, No Peace, The Ethics of Violent Protests. And in the book, I offer an analysis of the circumstances where the resort to violent protest might be justified. So what I want to do now is just to present to you with one insight, which kind of follows from the things I've said so far. So one of the most common objections to violent protests, like those London protests I described, is the harm that they inflict on ordinary citizens. And people who voice this objection often agree that everyone should have the right to political protest in democracies, and they agree that the protesters have serious grievances, but they hold that the protesters should not inflict harm on others for their own political gains. If protesters damage shops, cars, or residential homes, they are engaging in a sort of a wrongful extortion. They're using the pain of other people in order to get attention or to get what they want. And that seems manipulative and wrong. And I think this is a very important objection to the use of violence in protests. But in, our, in my view, it is not always a fair objection against violent protesters. And I have in mind here specifically protesters who take to the street to protest against a very serious injustice and where they reasonably believe that attempts to address their concerns through nonviolent means uh, or more civil means have been exhausted and have been unsuccessful. So the protesters believe that unless they <coughs> resort to more radical form of protest, they would not be able to draw the attention of the public to their cause or to influence policymakers. And when we kind of frame the problem in this way, we see that it is not that different to the issue of economic sanctions that I've just discussed. Here too, the means that are deployed in order to bring about a change of policy inflict harm on ordinary citizens who themselves do not necessarily support the policies that the protesters set out against. But we have already seen that sometimes 
you don't need to support a policy in order to be responsible for it. Especially in democratic societies, ordinary citizens participate in their state. And as a result, as we saw, they share responsibility for addressing its wrongdoings, wrongdoings that the governments commit. Sometimes it might be the case that what is needed in order to force a change of policy is a dose of uncivil protest. And if that's the case, I believe that in the same way that um, demands can be placed on participating citizens to share in the tax burdens and that is needed to redress this harm, fellow oppressed citizens can demand citizens to absorb some damage to their property in order to bring about a more just state of affairs. Okay, it's time for me to conclude. So I've given you today a taste of the question that occupied me throughout my career, some of my answers. I'm sure that some of you would disagree with me, but if so, I have achieved my goal. I'll quote here Bertrand Russell who said, the point of philosophy is to start with something so simple as not to seem worth stating and to add with something so paradoxical that no one will believe it. Now, of course, I hope that at least some of you uh, will believe at least some of what I've said, but I, for one, think that I need to think more about all of it. So I will continue doing that. And I want to end with some final but important things. First, I want to thank my life partner, Roland, which I believe is watching us. Um, Roland can't be here today because he's back at home in DC with our children. And I think it's not an understatement to say that I wouldn't be here today without Roland. Uh, Roland and I met in Nuffield College in my first year, which perhaps explains why I wasn't doing much research in that year. Um, and in addition to being a macroeconomist in his day job, he also turned out to be quite a good political theorist, a crisis manager, a chef, a book editor, and the list goes on and on and on. So I just want to say thank you, Roland, for all your patience. And I also want to thank my children, Eli and Diane, who give me so much joy and responsibility in my life. And one final word, which is, as Ben mentioned, um, this inaugural is also my valedictory. In January, I'm following my family, relocated to the US to start a new job at the other side of the ocean. I spent nine wonderful years at UCL and being part of this department has been a real honor. I will always see the SPP as my intellectual home. I live here with much sadness, but also with great sense of satisfaction in seeing how much the department has grown and evolved throughout the years. Thank you, everybody on this department, uh, for all the education that you've bestowed on me. I really look forward to our future interactions. Thank you very much. It's now my pleasure to introduce my good friend and colleague, Sarah Fine, from the University of Cambridge, who will give some final response, <laughs> I think it's called. Thank you. Well, listening to that, I'm reminded of my reaction when I first heard Avia discussing political theory back in 2003. So I turned to my friend Julia and I said, who's that? She's amazing. Right now, a disgusting number of years have passed since that first meeting, and I think we've definitely established who she is, and I'm pretty confident that I was absolutely right. She is amazing. <laughs> so with this inaugural stroke valedictory lecture, we've witnessed the talents and virtues that make our newly inaugurated Professor Pasternak such a tremendous scholar, teacher, valued colleague, and fantastic friend. So Avia has illustrated her exceptional clarity of thought, her independence of mind, her incomparable analytical skills, her capacity for great insight 
and originality. She's shown her enviable knowledge of politics and her nuanced response to its challenges. And we also see her optimism and hope in the face of disappointment. Furthermore, she's done all this with her characteristic good humor, generosity, and humility. Avia is going to be a brilliant asset to the community in North America, and we will all miss her greatly. So I look forward shortly to raising a glass to this excellent scholar, friend, and human being. So one for a select few here, Le Shana Haba'a de Toronto. Next year in Toronto, congratulations. Thank you.